Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man who goes for the fake punt on first down. He is the captain. Your mother goes for the fake punt. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. We have covered so many cases from Indiana, and a return to the Hoosier State means another great beer from one of our favorites. That's right, from Three Floyds Brewing Company, we have Apocalypse Cow. Garage grade, four and a half bottle caps out of five. This is a complex double India pale ale. We got hoppy floral notes, big citrus, and a little milk sugar to smooth it out. And this week's beer was brought to us by these smooth criminals right here. First up, we have a big cheers and thank you to our friend Robin with a Y out of Berkeley, California. And a big shout out to Sam G in Lakewood, Ohio. Next up, a double cheers. This goes out to Jesse Lyons in Valacia in New York, New York. And a big we like your jib to Jason in Spring Lake, North Carolina. Next up, we have a shout out to Alicia and her wonderful father, Andy, in Roanoke, Indiana. And last but certainly not least, we have carriers Jason and Matt at the Rexburg, Idaho Post Office. Everybody that we just mentioned went to truecrimegarage.com and clicked on the donate button. And for that, we thank you. All right, two things I need to tell you. Go to truecrimegarage.com, sign up on the mailing list. We're going to be announcing like a black friday christmas sale and if you're not on the mailing list you won't have the promo code to get the discount so go do that at truecrimegarage.com and right now on pre-order we have the less snuggle less snuggle sweaters boyfriend sweaters is what they're called they kind of hang off the shoulder a little bit they're on pre-order right now so if you want one get one they're going fast and that is enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. WTHR, Channel 13 is the news leader for Indianapolis and Central Indiana. For this week's case, they have been there since the beginning. December 12th, 2012. Cherise Walker Bingham was shot and killed near her home. The murder has gone unsolved. Not because of a lack of effort or know-how, but from a lack of evidence. Cherise was close with her family, and every year, near the first days of winter, the Walker family unfortunately has to experience the anniversary of her death. But it's also a very important marker for where the case stands today. It's one more chance to remind the public that someone very special was taken away far too early. An injustice has been done, and someone still needs to be held responsible. WTHR reported on December 12, 2016, that on this date, exactly four years ago, someone got away with murder. On the anniversary of the crime, police and the family of Sharice Bingham begged for help and justice. They returned to the scene of the crime, a popular walkway along the White River near New York Street on the edge of the IUPUI campus. Bingham's brother, Keith Walker, organized the vigil each year. He said, We want to keep praying about it, and justice will prevail. It really will. We just can't give up. Sharice Walker Bingham was walking her dogs. It was early evening. She was murdered with her own gun. Her family and friends are pleading and praying someone steps forward and points the police in the direction of her killer. At the vigil, one woman prayed out loud, saying, We know things are done in secret. Things are done in the dark will come to light. 2018 marked six years since the murder of Sharice Bingham. On this day, Keith Walker was quoted on Channel 13 saying, 
When this day rolls around, that's the day she got murdered. For my family, we just go back to how loving and caring she was. We just knew it wasn't time for her to leave us. Every December 12th, her brother Keith and other friends and family mark her murder at that location. Yeah, the pain is still there, said Walker. It will never go away. But the evil thoughts that I had, they're gone. They have been replaced by the strong drive to find the killer. He pleads with anybody on the trail that night. You had to see somebody walk up to her and say something to her. Bring this to a close. Let's find out why this happened, said Walker. Get some justice over it so both families can move on. The family asked anybody with information to please call the Indiana State Police at 1-800-453-4756. This week, we will explore the known facts of the case, and some previously not released to the public. And we will look into the possibilities. Was this a random crime? Or was there something or someone closer to home that could be responsible? This is True Crime Garage, and this is the case of Sharice Walker Bingham. Sharice Walker Bingham was 51 years old. She died just days before her 52nd birthday. Sharice was born on December 23rd, 1960. She was a native of Indianapolis, Indiana. Growing up in the area in a large family, surrounded by two brothers and a larger extended family. Sharice's mother was ill and unfortunately passed away in her early 50s. Sharice was called Reese by her family. She was popular and athletic in high school, and she had an affinity for dogs, particularly German shepherds. At the age of nine or 10, Sharice's family said she was so attached to her shepherd cruiser that the dog did everything with her. She continued to own and train German shepherds for the rest of her life. Sharice did go to veterinarian school, although it's not clear whether she completed her degree. In her early 20s, Sharice met and married a man named Eugene Bingham Jr., who is known as Bo Peep, according to Sharice's family. They were married for 28 years. Eugene was born on March 14th, 1961, so he was just a little younger than his wife. So we have Reese and Bo Peep. That's right. Now, Eugene is six foot tall and about 200 pounds. Before Sharice's death, He had worked part-time at UPS and also had a job at the Indianapolis Water Company. He had since retired from UPS, and then he lost his job at the water company. This is because the company had been sold, and the new corporate owners required drug testing of their employees. We have been told that Eugene could not pass the drug test. Sharice's family tells us that Eugene was a pot smoker. Sharice did not share this hobby with her husband. In fact, she was extremely health conscious. She watched what she ate, she exercised, and she worked out regularly. Now, Sharice and her husband, Eugene, they had no children. So Sharice was crazy about her two dogs, treating them like they were her kids. She worked full-time at a couple of different long-term positions throughout her adult life. Now, just months before, she took a position at the Gatorade Bottling Plant. This is in Indianapolis. She was a member of the New Haven Missionary Baptist Church, where she was very active in the community there. Now, Sharice would be described as tall, attractive, with short hair. According to Sharice's aunt, Deborah McMurray, she had a way about her that when she walked into a room, she made people turn their heads. The general known facts of December 12th, 2012, the day in question, is that Sharice Bingham was out walking her dogs, presumably alone. Now, even though it was after dark, it was still just evening time, fairly early, and this is in a big city 
on a well-traveled path, and her two German shepherds are with her and are trained to protect. This is like a walking path or biking path, right? Correct. So this is around 6.30 p.m. when a passing cyclist found her body, bloodied and prone, with her two dogs circling her in distress. What happened and why would someone kill this warm, beloved, church-growing, hard-working woman? Let's get into the details of that day to try to figure it out. Right. So the 12th of December, 2012, it was a cold Wednesday evening. Sharice was scheduled to work the overnight shift at the Gatorade bottling plant. She was going about her typical routine that evening, which involved walking her two dogs. This is May Day and Tsunami. She set out with them for a walking trail along the White River. This is right near the Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis campus, IUPUI, about three miles from Sharice's home. Sharice drove to this location in her truck and parked it in a small lot along the North White River Parkway West. She then proceeded to cross the White River on the West New York Street Bridge and then turned onto the White River Trail. This, as the captain points out, is a trail that is popular for biking, walking, and running during the daytime because it connects the IUPUI campus to some of the dormitories. But it would have been dark or nearly dark by this time when Cherie started out on her walk. The trail at this time of day would be much less populated after sunset. Right, but she's in shape. She has her two dogs with her. Now she's taking the dogs on the walk, but the dogs are also a form of protection for her. And she also carries a gun with her when she walks. Most of the time. Keep in mind, she works at night. This is part of her daily routine. This is morning for her, but it's evening for the rest of us. In Indiana, on December 12th, sunset is right around 5 p.m. or so. Right. So it would be dark or nearly dark by this time. Now, we are not certain how far along on her walk Sharice got to, whether she was just heading out or actually on her way back. Right, and that's because they don't have a definitive time of when she started or how long she was walking for. Detective Les Norvell of the Indiana State Police, who worked the case, told us that based on the timeline, it seems that Sharice was just starting out on her walk, but the timing is not known for certain. A cyclist later told authorities that he had passed her along his ride and that she had to corral the two dogs who were off of a leash in order to let him pass. The cyclist noted that Sharice was walking with the leash slung around her neck, you know, so she had a leash with her in case she should need it, but was not using it at the time that this cyclist passed. Sometime later, the cyclist was on his way back when he came across Sharice's body with the dogs circling her. Sharice was lying on the paved trail face down. This was near the intersection of West New York Street and Limestone Street, close to where she had parked. There was blood on the concrete beneath her. Indiana State Police officers were dispatched to the scene at approximately 6.30 p.m., this according to the press statement. This was... Indiana State Police jurisdiction, not Indianapolis PD, because the trail was technically state parkland. Right. Students from IUPUI nearby who saw the police cars and heard the sirens, they were shocked. This was normally quite a safe, very public space. Right. One of the students who was interviewed by the local Fox station after biking by the crime scene said, he could see two German shepherds standing over a body before he was ordered away by the police. Yeah, her, her dogs were protecting her. When Detective Norvell arrived on the scene, he was told that when medical personnel arrived, Charisse's two dogs were guarding her and would not permit the EMTs to get anywhere near her. Yeah, They could not even approach her to check for vital signs. The dogs were 
this is their words. People were very sensitive about how you describe dogs and their actions because we love them so much, right? But the words that we've been told was the dogs were too threatening for EMTs to approach Charisse. Yeah, which is interesting to me because she's walking the dogs without a leash. So we could just assume that they're they're trained dogs, they're well-behaved dogs. She babied them, but they're probably... Most people don't take their dog for a walk and take it off the chain if they don't think uh, the dog is going to be able to control themselves. So obviously she's walking with the dogs without the leash, the leash being around her neck, and then this attack happens, and now they're trying to guard her or protect her, and anybody that gets near, they're almost acting uh, in, a, in a vicious manner. Well, the dogs are on edge obviously because something went down and that's what we're trying to figure out and then on top of that they're the probably the person that they love by far the most right is obviously hurting um and they they are aware of that the indiana state police press statement indicated that the canines appeared to be protecting to be protective of the decedent and would not let investigative personnel approach Another officer at the scene said that the dogs were circling the body and being aggressive toward anyone. The Indianapolis Animal Control was called in and did tranquilize the dogs and remove them. Now, Detective Norvell said that he found the victim lying on her back. She had been turned over by EMTs who were checking on her injuries. There was blood and foam on her face and blood beneath her body. She was later identified as 51-year-old Sharice Walker Bingham. Strewn about Sharice's body, police found some very important things. Okay, so they found her flip-style cell phone, which was beeping at the time. This, according to the detective, indicating it needed to be charged. An Indiana firearm carry permit was found. A pair of black winter gloves, a small caliber semi-automatic handgun, it was determined that Sharice Bingham had been shot. Detective Norvell told us that one thing that was strange was that Sharice's personal items were scattered around the ground near her body, as if she or someone else had pulled them out in an attempt to get at her phone or something else in her pocket. Now, I know that everyone is thinking, what are we going on? What's going on here, right? We have a woman found dead in the park her firearm is found near her she was determined to be shot was this an accident a suicide a homicide i yeah, think we should yeah. go through each of these scenarios well to- i think investigators originally thought because it, it was her own gun that that it was a suicide one thing the police spent a significant amount of time looking into early on was if this could have been an accident Sharice owned a gun, Mm -hmm. and one had been found at the scene. Sharice's husband, Eugene, suggested that perhaps the dogs had jumped up on her, causing the gun to go off. And Sharice, he said, had been considering carrying her gun with the round chambered. Eugene told her that this was a bad idea. Right. But if this is how this went down, she may not have listened to him. So... You're going to carry a gun for protection, but you're not going to have any rounds loaded in it, is what he's saying. Well, for safety purposes, most people do not round a, do not put a round in the chamber. Not in the chamber, but there's still bullets in the gun. Correct. Okay. On the night that she died, she would have carried her gun in the right breast pocket of her coveralls. As we know, she did not have her gun pouch with her. This... All of this stuff is going to become very important to how a lot of stuff, we're able to figure out a lot of this stuff here, okay? So pay attention. She, You pay attention. She would have carried the gun in her right breast pocket of her coveralls. We know this because she did not have her gun pouch with her, and the coveralls had holes in the hip pockets, so it would have been impossible to carry the gun in there. So the gun had to be placed in the chest area pocket. Police conducted tests on the gun and determined 
that it required 10 pounds of pressure to pull the trigger. Keep that in mind when we're considering that one of the dogs managed to jump up and somehow wedge down the trigger, shooting Sharice in the chest. Right. But we also need to account for how the gun got out of her pocket and into onto the ground. Perhaps she had been holding it and somehow fired it at herself accidentally. This seems incredibly unlikely. Police didn't actually spend too much time on this accident theory in light of other information which surfaced during the investigation. Uh, now, I wouldn't rule out the, the possibility that a, the dog would be able to create 10 pounds of pressure. Just the likelihood that their paw or something would be able to fit, you know, to pull the trigger. That To me, that seems more unlikely. Well, there's a there's several problems with that, and I agree with you 100%. I, I actually think 10 pounds of pressure might be a little light considering how large I'm assuming these dogs are. Right. German and, Shepherds are not small dogs. Well, and if a dog jumps up on you when they're excited, you know, sometimes they can knock you back a little bit, even if they're not that big of a dog. The problem then becomes two different issues here. One if the gun is secure in her pocket, how is the the math of, of in the angles right. of getting a dog to accidentally clip that trigger seems incredibly almost impossible. Yeah. It right. Seeming so, like the magic bullet. Right. Theory. So then, then you wonder like, well, would her gun have been out for some reason? And then, and then the accident occurs because if the gun's not out, it seems very unlikely that a paw or a claw or, you know, the dog's nail or whatever would, would cause the trigger to be pulled. Right. And if that is the scenario, then how did the gun end up on the ground next to her? But it right. should have still been in her pocket when she was found dead. Which I, look, I, I don't mind the idea of carrying a weapon with you to protect yourself, but tell me in what scenario is she walking down this path with her dogs and just she just decides to pull out the gun to look at it? Like, because you're not going to fire it in this area, even if you're going to practice shooting, you don't fire it in this area. It's downtown on this, this bike running walking path. Right. So it just seems odd to me unless she got startled by something and then she pulled it out. Right. One would have to believe that, that something would have to have gone down for her to pull that gun out of her pocket. And then now we're, th this is where it gets too weird because now you get into just this long trail of consecutive events that all seem unlikely by themselves, let alone in sequence. Let's get into the, the suicide thought, because like we said, police didn't spend a ton of time on the accident theory, and it's a lot of that is just because the math of it doesn't seem to work out, and we'll right. go through that a little more in just a bit. Now, according to the early reports, the coroner's office initially was not certain whether Sharice's death was a homicide or a suicide. On December 14th, two days after her body was found, the coroner issued a report stating that Sharice Bingham died after being shot in the chest, but the manner of death was still to be determined. Detective Norvell stated that the initial thought at the onset of the investigation was that the victim might have killed herself. Right. The Walker family, however, was adamant that Sharice would not have killed herself, and soon it became clear. Detective Norvell said that the evaluation of the entire scene and the circumstances of such led them to the conclusion that Sharice did not kill herself. Wouldn't they be able to prove whether or not she shot the gun? We had that conversation, and you and I will get into that in just a bit, but what they, how they arrived at this conclusion is actually not from gunpowder residue tests on her person. They base this on the fact that Sharice most likely did not shoot herself and leave the dogs unattended, roaming free. This would be very out of character. 
Right. She cared about these dogs like she would have her own children. You wouldn't go to an area with the purpose of killing oneself and leave your, your most beloved of anything on this planet out there unsafe after, uh, after well, you disagree, kill yourself. Because if, you, if you're planning to end your life, then what does it matter what happens to the dogs? You didn't love them enough to stick around, but... I, but but I see that as being a point that somebody would make. I I think the other point too is she's heavily involved in her church, and that would probably go against her religious beliefs to to take her own life. Well, what you're going to have is you're going to have a mountain of these these little different items and thoughts and theories that make it unlikely that she killed herself. And regardless of how you feel or if you agree or disagree, it would be generally considered strange for somebody that cared about those dogs so much to take them with them to and kill themselves and leave these dogs out running around who knows what could have happened to well them it, after it would be case. very strange to go and commit suicide in a park you know especially a, a heavily heavily traveled area and you decide oh i'm going to shoot myself in the chest so chances are i'm going to bleed to death and by doing it in a park, you're going to have more people that possibly would see you and, and call for help. So a lot of things don't line up here. She also brought along with her fruit. She brought a snack with her for her walk. You wouldn't likely do that if your intent was to kill yourself. Yeah. Suicide snack. She also locked her vehicle and secured the steering wheel with an anti-theft wheel device. Right. And investigators found Sharice's flip phone open, this leading them to believe that she had attempted to make a call for help after she was shot. As the investigation progressed, physical evidence proved that this was no suicide. According to the family, there was only one shot to, to Sharice's body, and it was at close range. Lab techs found a bullet hole in the right sleeves of her two outer layer garments Sharice was wearing. Then an additional bullet hole was found in the clothes covering Sharice's chest. This is where the bullet was lodged. This means that Sharice was standing with her arms or at least her right arm out in front of her in a defensive posture when the gun fired. The bullet shot through the sleeves of her extended right arm and went into the sternum area, killing her. So once investigators examined the trajectory of the bullet, Detective Norvell told us that they ruled out suicide. It's when you follow the path that that bullet took, given the evidence that you find on her person, the bullet holes in the sleeve and then the bullet hole in her chest, it would be impossible for her to have killed herself. So, Captain, this is a murder. If there is something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals, BetterHelp Online Counseling can help. BetterHelp offers licensed professional counselors who specialize in issues such as depression, anxiety, relationships, trauma, anger, family conflicts, LGBT matters, grief, self-esteem, and more. Connect with your professional counselor in a safe and private online environment and get help at your own time and at your own pace. Anything that you share is completely confidential, and it's so convenient. You can schedule a secure video or phone session as well as chat and text with your therapist, and if for some reason you're not happy with your counselor, though you can request a new one at any time for no additional charge. Best of all, it's a truly affordable option. Our listeners even get 10% off your first month with discount code GARAGE. So why not get started today? Go to betterhelp.com slash garage, then simply fill out a questionnaire to help them assess your needs and get matched with the counselor you'll love. That's betterhelp.com slash garage. You know what is not productive? Interrupting your workday to fight through traffic just to get to the post office. Here's a tip. Anything you can do at the post office, you can do at stamps.com. Whether you're a small office sending invoices or even a warehouse sending thousands of packages a day, simply use your computer to print official U.S. postage 24-7 for any letter, any package, 
any class of mail anywhere you want to send. Once your mail is ready, just hand it to your mail carrier or drop it in a mailbox. With Stamps.com, you also get five cents off every first class stamp and up to 40% off priority mail. Not to mention it's a fraction of the cost of those expensive postage meters. Don't spend a minute of your holiday season at the post office this year. Sign up for Stamps.com with my promo code GARAGE and get a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to Stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in GARAGE. That's Stamps.com, enter GARAGE. Stamps.com, never go to the post office again. You know what is a sneaky, good holiday gift? Super comfortable Bombas socks. I love my Bombas. I'm rocking some right now. I love the style, the colors. They have socks for women, men, and kids. And another thing that I love about Bombas is they give back. They donate to people in need. And I'm looking at their website right now. Over 27 million items donated to people in need. These are wonderful small acts of human kindness that are helping people change their lives. Bombas socks are soft, like made with the softest cotton in the world soft. But they're built with extra cushioning, so whether you're walking, the dog, chilling at home, or saving the world, you'll be comfortable. I'm so excited about my new Bomba socks that you gave me. Four new pairs of Bomba socks. I posted that on Instagram. Bomba socks provide support in places that you didn't even know you need, like your arches. Each sock is built with a special arch support system that feels like a nice hug for your foot. And they're smooth across the top. No more annoying toe seam. You know, that toe seam kind of, it's always itchy to me. Bombas makes all types of socks. Dress socks for work, performance socks for working out, and limited edition holiday socks. They even have a line of merino wool socks that are soft, warm, and naturally moisture wicking. Bombas is the gift even that person will love. Even that person who seems impossible to shop for. And every pair that you buy, Bombas donates a pair to somebody in need. So you get an awesome pair of socks and somebody in need gets a pair as well. Do something good for yourself. Do something good for this world. Go to bombas.com slash garage today and get 20% off your first purchase. That's B-O-M-B-A-S dot com slash garage. Bombas. They're amazing socks. I'm telling you, you're going to love them. Bombas.com slash garage. All right, we're back, you filthy animals. Cheers to you, Captain. Cheers to all the filthy animals. Now let's talk about the gun found at the scene. Ballistics. Her, her, her gun. Yes. Yeah. Ballistics matched the bullet found in Sharice's body to the gun found found next to her as the captain said it was Sharice's own gun she was shot with her own weapon Sharice and her husband Eugene each owned a gun they had the same model of handgun this was a 25 caliber sterling semi-automatic she often brought the gun with her to walk her two dogs but Sharice seemed to be a little more concerned about her safety than usual just shortly before her death. This is according to her relatives. Her aunt, Deborah McMurray, told interviewers that Sharice seemed to believe that someone was following her. She specifically said that it was a dark blue blazer that was following her. So we have banned the van captain, now we have banned the blazer. Yeah, I'll work on those t-shirts. Yeah, and and don't forget the tan VW bug. Yeah. Ban, well, don't ban the, the cute ones, just the tan ones. Only motorcycles are safe. The strange thing about the gun, look, Sharice was known to keep the gun in a special carrying pouch that was designed to hold it. Right. Reporter Russ McQuaid, who works for Fox 59 and who wrote extensively about this case, told Crime Watch Daily that Sharice always kept this gun in that pouch. The pouch was discovered at home, and the gun was discovered by her side. Sharice's family backs this statement up. They say Sharice kept the gun in the carrying pouch when it was 
at home when it was on her person. The gun in that pouch should have been together that day by just about everybody's accounts. But that night, the gun pouch was not only not found with Sharice, but it was later found at the home that she shared with her husband of 28 years, Eugene. This, as said, was highly unusual. The gun should have been in its pouch if she brought it along with her that evening. Not only that, Eugene Bingham was the one to call Detective Norvell, this about two weeks after Sharice's death, to tell him that he found the gun pouch at their home. According to True Crime Daily, when detectives processed the gun, They found no usable prints on it. It could have been wiped down. Mm -hmm. It certainly seems that Sharice's prints at least should have been on the gun, right? Let's talk about that for just a second here. If, in fact, she accidentally shot herself or suicide, or even if she took it with her just for protection and somebody approached her and something went down, why would her fingerprints not be on the gun if she, in fact, brought it with her that night? Right. She would have had to pick up the gun, place it in her pocket, and then if she did pull the gun out, now she's using her hands again. We did say that gloves were found at the scene, but they were not found on her at the time. Right. So that's that's pretty alarming right there. Correct. How could someone take the gun from her, shoot her, in the presence of these two protective dogs, too. That's the other question that you have to ask here. Yeah, I mean, the fact that EMT can't even get to the body because of the the dogs, you would think that somebody, any kind of confrontation between her and another individual, these dogs are going to become very protective, very vicious, very quickly. Something that was found on the gun was DNA. DNA belonging to Eugene Bingham. Eugene told police that, of course, his DNA would be on the gun as he regularly cleaned the gun for his wife. But, again, it's still interesting that why would you have Eugene's DNA on the gun and not the killer's right? unless they're the same? Or why would you have Eugene's DNA on the gun but not have Sharice's fingerprints or somebody else's fingerprints? It's all very strange. The thing, too, with with the dogs. Now, with both of their owners, with Eugene and Sharice being gun owners themselves, and I can't say this specifically to these two dogs, Mayday and Tsunami, but one thing I have experienced in my life is that dogs that are familiar with guns, that have been around guns, sometimes they they will flee at the sight of one. And that's because typically dogs don't like loud noises. Right. Guns can be very loud. Usually are very loud. There are many situations that I've witnessed where even just target shooting or just seeing the gun, they identify that object with a loud noise that they do not like. And sometimes they will in fact flee the area. So that could explain how someone was able to approach Sharice and not be attacked by the dogs. Yes, we know the dogs were with her body when she was later found, but this meaning they returned to her. Right. But I also, going back to the DNA being found, uh, the husband's DNA, Eugene's DNA being found, the tricky thing for me there is, let's say there was an attacker, Mm -hmm. right? The attacker takes the gun out, shoots her, then knows he's going to wipe it down, wipes it down, throws the gun down. Okay, so now we don't have any fingerprints. Maybe we don't have her DNA on it. But if he is cleaning the gun, his DNA could be inside the cracks and crevices of the gun. Correct. And so that's, so it's not clear in the investigation of did they just pull it out and just wipe the handle or wipe the, uh, you know, wherever, you know what I mean? Like, did they wipe the trigger or did they have some kind of solution on 
um, like a Q-tip and and went inside the cracks and crevices, and that's where they found the DNA. I wish it was a little more clear, and it's not clear to me in this investigation. Well, I think you're probably spot on with your assessment of their words, and often we have to do that. We have to read between the lines to come up with what is actually going on in the investigation. We were very fortunate that Detective Norvell and very fortunate that the Indiana State Police spoke with us regarding this case. And they did tell us some things that have not been released to the public yet. When this comes out, now they're released. There were questions they did not answer, which is totally fine and more than acceptable. The, The thing here is they were involved with us because they want this case solved. They have poured a lot of effort and a lot of heart into this investigation. And so it was, it was great. It's good for true crime garage that we get some insider information, but it's also good for their investigation. The, the thing that we have to worry about here, captain is the threat of this case going cold. That's what everybody is in fear of. Yeah. And so I think you're spot on with your analysis of their words and their actions. I believe that you're correct, that that they probably were going to those cracks and crevices and to the, the small little parts of that gun to recover anyone's DNA. And the DNA that they came up with was Eugene's. Because what it looks like to me is that whoever used that gun to shoot Sharice, they wiped it down and they were probably wearing gloves at the time of her murder. Right. So all I'm saying is that I don't think that makes Eugene my number one suspect because of his DNA being found. His DNA was probably right where it should have been if it's from her him cleaning the gun. Right, but I'm not going to rule him out because we don't find anything on the gun, really. Right, that's the, that's the biggest problem. There should be something else, and there's not. And that's why I think the assumption of Sharice bringing the gun with her that night is a dangerous one to assume. I think that the evidence points it to that she did not bring the gun with her that night. Right. And then that makes it even more diabolical. Right. Then you start going, okay, is Eugene responsible or somebody else that's close to her? Or is it uh, a hit and and Eugene is, is giving the, the perpetrator her weapon? to make it look like possibly a suicide or accident. Well, let's go back to the question about Sharice's dogs, because regardless of what I said about seeing a weapon, seeing a firearm, and then they might, they might flee or they might cower. According to Sharice's family, they firmly believe that these two dogs would attack any stranger who was attempting to harm Sharice. Her family says the dogs were not friendly with people that they did not know. And we know that they weren't on a leash that night. So they would have been able to chase and or bite somebody. Yeah, right. Again, this uh, I don't want to say that her family is lying. I'm just saying that they kind of contradict the two. Uh, their dogs weren't friendly with people that they didn't know. But they had to be at least friendly enough or obedient enough to be off their leash because, you know, Cerise didn't seem like a, a irresponsible dog owner. So the general rule that I apply with my dogs is I leash them in situations where I believe they will not, uh, respond to my commands. Okay. Right. And so there are times that I do not leash them because I, am of the belief that they will respond to my commands, meaning I still have control over my dogs, even though they are not leashed. What I'm getting at here and where I think the the family's heads are at with this situation is they're not leashed because they're out walking. This is supposed to be something good for them. And if it's just a passerby, if it's just somebody walking or cycling and she needs to throw a command to the dogs, she believes that they will respond to that command. They are still under her control. Right. In some type of situation where we have an aggressor, where we have an attacker, what they're saying is 
you wouldn't command your dogs in that situation. You wouldn't attempt to control your dogs in that situation. You would attempt to defend yourself. And therefore, they are saying that these dogs, had they seen her in any kind of distress, would have attacked or chased whoever did that. Right. Where they have the biggest problem is they say that the only person that the dogs were comfortable with to the level that they were comfortable with Sharice was Eugene. As Eugene lived with the dogs, he was an owner of the dogs. He was a caretaker at times for the dogs, helping with walks and feeding them and such. So I, I, I think we need to be clear here and clear up one thing saying we actually don't know for sure that the dogs did not attack the shooter. Right. It's possible that they chased away or even bit Sharice's attacker and then came back to her body. Mm -hmm. Detective Norvell told us that there was an indication that the dogs were, quote, having a reaction to ingesting blood from the scene, end quote. It's not clear what this means, whether they licked Sharice trying to heal her. Right. Or perhaps they got a piece of someone. Detectives checked area hospitals, but found that no one came in the days after the shooting to be treated for a dog bite. But the fact that it was her gun that was used to kill her indicates that either the shooter got very close to her, risking a dog attack, or the gun was in the possession of someone else. One of the questions I want to know is, remember how you said that that, that biker saw Sharice walking the dogs and she had to like... Um, Corral them was their word. Right. So they could pass by. What I wonder is how far the dogs were away. Because I think if this is a, a planned attack by somebody, um, let's, let's say somebody's following her, this blue blazer or this is a planned attack from her husband, you could, if you knew, I mean, you you don't know that the dogs are going to be off the leash, but you might know her behaviors, her habits of walking, and you go, okay, the dogs are going to be on off their leash. There's going to be a, a, a distance between them, and that gives you a window uh, in, in order to, to attack the person. Because the other thing that people aren't putting... <laughs> I think into play is it's great to say, well, see Eugene, Eugene can be, uh, he could get close enough, but you also have to have a situation where you get close enough. You're not seen by anybody else. And then you have to leave the scene by, by not being seen by anybody else. Am I making any sense there? Well, yeah, that, so that puts a lot of different scenarios into play, but it also takes some of them out of play when you really try to analyze it, not just for the fact of the dogs, but from the fact that any attack that would take a, a decent length of time, you risk detection from possible eyewitnesses. So under those scenarios or, or playing to those thoughts, you have a, a couple of couple of ideas here. A person attacked Sharice, wrestled the gun from her, shot her, and the dogs ignored it, and this was not seen by any eyewitnesses. All of this seems unlikely because, as said, the dogs had to be tranquilized later. Right. The other idea is a person attacked Sharice, wrestled the gun away from her, and shot her, and then the dogs did attack, but the shooter was able to run away. And then the other scenario would be someone shot Sharice from a little bit of a distance, already having the gun in their possession when they arrived at the park. That scenario, to me, seems to be the most likely because it, it one, as you said, if there is a bit of distance between you and the dogs or if giving the scenario the lay of the land and where everybody is at that time, giving the opportunity for someone to approach her, not having to rustle the gun from her. Yeah. This also would take the least amount of time, which would, which would prevent or really at least just make it less likely that somebody would see you in the act of shooting her. Right. 
Charisse's family tells us that, that things were not right between Charisse and Eugene for some time. We need to take a look at their marriage. They were married for quite a long time. 28 years. Yeah, no kids. Charisse, I, I, according to her family, they didn't tell, she didn't tell them about any specific problems, but they say they were aware that Charisse was hardworking, church going. She was not down with Eugene smoking pot and drinking all the time. According to her aunt, this is Deborah McMurray, who we've referenced earlier. She said years into the marriage, Eugene moved into the basement, living on the downstairs level while Sharice lived upstairs. <laughs> he's like, right. She's he's saying like, basically this that marriage ain't working. I'm going to move down to the basement. I'm taking my act and I'm going downstairs. I live in the basement. Um, she says that basically she believed that the two cohabitated together rather than living as husband and wife. Right. Let's get into what the police were able to learn from Eugene himself. So while the Indiana State Wait, Police. What, what was his um, uh, nickname again? Bo Peep, according to her family. <laughs> Bo Peep is well, going to live in the basement. Unfortunately, you, you know, you never know when somebody gets, when they acquire their nickname. Yeah. Unfortunately, some people get a nickname when they're like two or three years old, and it, yeah. and it just sticks with them for the rest of their life. Uh, the Indiana State Police, when they were processing the scene, the murder scene, and Sharice's truck, which was still parked by the river, Eugene Bingham arrived on the scene. A detective recorded his arrival time as 11.23 p.m. Detectives spoke with him. And he told them that he was asleep on the couch at home. And he woke up around 9.30 p.m. and noticed that Sharice wasn't home. This, he says, was unusual for several reasons, but mainly because she was a routine person and she did, in fact, have to be at work at 10.30 that night. He tried to call her phone and had no success. So he left the house to go look for her. He says he needed to go to three different locations. These were all locations where he knew she would typically walk the dogs. The White River Park was the last place that he checked. When he arrived, he yeah. said he saw... I don't know. This seems a little fishy. But go ahead. Sorry. When he arrived, he said that he saw crime scene tape around his wife's vehicle. That alerted him. That made him approach the detectives. On December 13th, this is the day after the murder. The Indiana State Police detectives, uh, this is Les Norvell and Matthew Lawrence, they conducted a thorough interview with Eugene. Some things that he told them the previous night at the scene of the crime seemed off. In the interview, Eugene stated that Sharice was a creature of habit. On the days when she was working the night shift, she would get up late, do some stuff around the house, exercise, shower, take the dogs for a walk, and then go to work. On the 12th, the detectives said that Eugene and Sharice did have a conversation that day. Then Sharice left to walk the dogs. Eugene says that he stayed home to watch the Miami Heat Warriors NBA basketball game. Uh -huh. He reportedly told investigators that Sharice did not leave the house until after the game started, which was around 7.30 p.m. Which her body was found at 6.30. Yeah, this is beyond strange. It's what you would call impossible. Yes, but again, it's like he lives in the basement. You know, there might be some fumes, so he might, <laughs> might not be good at telling time. Yeah, he doesn't need to tell time. He... It, it's a fact of when the game started. If his if he's basing this time off of she left before the basketball game started, we can all figure that out. And as you said, Captain, the police, not just was she found, her body found before this time, the police, they were dispatched to the scene at 630, a full hour before Eugene says his wife left the house. Not only was she dead, she was found. Police confirmed that the game, the basketball game coverage, 
TV coverage began at 7.38 p.m., and the tip-off was 7.41 p.m. Well, it's almost like he's trying to establish an alibi for himself. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, oh, I was watching the game, and, and I can prove that because uh, this is when the game started. Yeah, but as, as this timeline alibi. points out, one would have time to to attack her, flee the scene, and make it home in time to watch the basketball game. Now, he says she left as the game was starting. So back to his alibi. Let's continue with what he says he was doing, right? Eugene said that he fell asleep on the couch and he didn't wake up until 930 or so. Because Sharice and the dog should have been home and she needed to leave for work, according to him, at 10 o'clock, he became concerned then. He tried calling her from the home phone and got no response. Of course he's concerned. He doesn't have a job if she doesn't go to work. Her bills don't get paid. He says he got dressed and then after getting dressed, tried calling her from his cell phone as he was leaving to check these walking locations. Again, he got nothing with this phone call. He wasn't as concerned about her not answering the phone is what he tells police. Eugene specified that Sharice usually carried her phone with her, but she almost had it off. She, you know, some, some people turn the phone off. She was one of those types. She would power on only if she wanted to make a call. So they pulled Eugene's phone records and what they found did not mesh with what Eugene was telling them. The home phone called Sharice's cell at 11.02 PM. The call from Eugene's cell to his wife's phone was made at 11.09 PM. These calls were made an hour and a half after Eugene said he woke up and noticed his wife was missing. And well after he said he made the calls. Right. So we have multiple lies from him. And then that makes you want to question about the gun when he says, well, I cleaned her gun for her. Well, is that a lie as well? I mean, this is evidence that he's a lying crotch sniffer, you know? Yeah. Yeah. One thing that I would question, this is not going to be any proof of anything, but there are some gun owners that don't shoot their guns. They just don't shoot them. You know, Uh some people regularly shoot guns and people that regularly do need to clean them. People that don't shoot them usually don't clean them. So I would be curious as to what their family thought her activities were with that firearm. I immediately, when you said there's gun owners that don't shoot their guns, I was like, that seems so stupid. But I know a lot of people that own guitars that never, <laughs> that yeah. never play them. So yeah, I have a guitar that I need to restring. You have and, a nice guitar collection for somebody that doesn't play. Right. And I, in fact, I have one that I need to restrung and it's been in that state for like two years now. <laughs> so one day, Get it together, Colonel. One day I'll have strings on that guitar. Does it still? And she will play like it, never before. You used to have a guitar that smelled like onions. That's the same one. Oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the other thing with his phone calls, Eugene's cell received a call at 7.41 p.m. This is from a friend. This call went to his voicemail. This friend was a chiropractor who later told police that he called Eugene because he had heard about a woman's death on the news and wanted to be sure it was not Sharice. It's not clear if this chiropractor is female or male, Mm -hmm. but we do know that not only is Sharice a friend, but a client and, and this person knew uh, Eugene and Sharice equally as well. Correct. Yeah. The, the cell tower information showed that when this call came into Eugene's cell phone. The pingy ping. The ping, ping. Yeah, the phone pinged off a tower that was near the murder site. Specifically, the tower Eugene's phone pinged with this 741 call was east of a different tower that was closer to his home, which Eugene's phone would most likely have pinged off had he been at home of at the time of this call, the call hit the sector of this further tower that correlated with where Sharice was killed. 
the southern sector of the tower, whereas if Eugene had been at home and for some reason the call pinged the further away tower. It, okay, that's it's you, all just, very, you just right. So there's the a there's a, out of me. All right, I I wasn't clear with that. What I'm yeah. trying to say is there's a southern sector tower and there's a western sector tower. Right? Tower Tower A and Tower B. Correct. It hit off of the opposite one. It hit the off of the one closest to where her body was found, not the tower that was closest to his home, as what detectives were originally told would be the situation had he been at home. So this, as you pointed out. He's lying already about some things, and we know this from the phone records. Now police believe he's lying even more because we have the phone records that don't match with his story, and we have this cell phone tower ping information that do not match with his story. All right, so Eugene Bo Peep, we know he's a lying shit princess, but but what does this mean? Is he just lying or... Or is he misremembering or? Well, it's a little more damning than that because that was a really long way of saying this. Okay. According to the cell tower data, Eugene's phone was not at his home at 741 at the time that that call came in from the chiropractor friend. Right. About an hour and a hour and 10 minutes after Cerise was found. But even more damning than that, according to this, the cell tower data, the phone was down near the White River and the West New York Street Bridge. This is near where she parked her car, near where her body was found. Right. And Eugene did tell police, of course, they're going to ask him this question once they have this other information. He tells police that no one else would have had access to his phone, meaning by his own admission that if, in fact, his phone was there, in the area that she was killed at 741, the phone was with him. Right. So Eugene told detectives that the cell phone records could not be accurate when they confronted him with this information. This is in regard to the 1109 call. He says that that can't be accurate because he was already at the scene at that time, learning about his wife's death from a detective at 1109. Right. Again, that doesn't gel with the information that we have on record. The record shows that he actually didn't arrive on the scene until 11.23 p.m. He, Eugene, reiterated that he had tried to call his wife beginning around 9.30 when he realized she wasn't home yet. He also said that at least one of the deleted calls was from his wife. So they found three deleted calls. He states one of the deleted calls was from his wife. All of these statements, they're, they're contradicted by the actual phone records. Eugene continued to talk to investigators, and in summary, he told police that his wife would not have killed herself. The two had just joined a new church, and they were baptized again. Also, Sharice was a happy person, and they enjoyed each other, although their marriage wasn't perfect. He said that there was no way that Mayday and Tsunami would let anyone near Sharice. He said there was no way a stranger could harm her and those dogs still be around. He said he didn't believe that there was anyone who would want to harm his wife. And it seems to me he inadvertently is pointing the finger at himself. Whatever struggles you are facing from depression and anxiety to trauma and grief, BetterHelp can connect you with a professional counselor in a safe and private online environment. It's so convenient. You can schedule secure video or phone sessions as well as chat and text with your therapist and anything that you share is completely confidential. Best of all, it's a truly affordable option. Our listeners even get 10% off your first month with discount code GARAGE. So why not get started? Simply go to betterhelp.com slash garage and fill out a questionnaire to get matched with the counselor you'll love today. That's betterhelp.com slash garage. We want to thank everybody out there for listening. We want to thank you for telling a friend. Also, thank you to everyone who shares these cases and these stories on social media. 
These cases need people's attention, especially this one. Join us back here in the garage tomorrow. Until then, be good, be kind, and don't litter. 